So last week we just sort of began to introduce right this Buddhist idea of emptiness. Um, we explored a little bit this idea of uh, what the technical term for it is the object of negation, right? But this um, like a false idea, right? A false way of perceiving who we are or, or and what objects are, the nature of objects. So today I want to um, want to at least introduce let's call it, uh, this I- the uh, really important idea actually the very essence uh, in a way of uh, actually you can say this is the essence of all Buddhist teachings right actually the Dalai Lama says if you had to, like um, not just the Buddha himself said it, like also if you want to like if you had to sort of summarize like uh, sometimes they call it a, a, the slogan of Buddhism right? if there is such a thing. It would be that all uh, all things are dependent. Right? Everything is dependent on the reason. Right? Um, and I wanted to um, actually I wanted to read a couple of quick, uh, just very brief uh, quotes because uh, about the connection between emptiness and dependent arising. Right? So the Buddha himself right, said in the uh, a couple different places actually he said very similar things. But this is this quote from the Sagaramati Sutra, the Questions of Sagaramati. He said. Those things which arise dependently are free of inherent existence. So it means those things which arise dependently, are dependently arisen, are empty of inherent existence. Uh, Then the Buddha said almost the exact same thing in another place. He said, whatever depends on circumstances is empty of its own nature. So these, like, we're going to have to explore. What does that mean, empty of its own nature? We'll We'll explore that today. That's what we want to start exploring. Uh, Nagarjuna, right, who is the most sort of famous explicator of the Buddhist te- Buddha's teaching <coughs> of emptiness in India, said, that which is produced having met this and that collection of causes and conditions is not inherently produced. So it's empty of inherent production. And again, one might say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to be empty of nature? What does it mean to be empty of production? And he said, actually, think of that quote, right? That which is produced having met with this and that collection of causes and conditions, is not inherently produced. So, again, like, it's very, you say, so, uh, he's saying it's, it's produced, but it's not inherently produced. So you might say, what does that mean? And actually, I want to say something about that. So sometimes people um, will say, oh, that's, uh, sometimes people who misunderstand that human question will say, well, it's just a paradox, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean anything. Or it's just a paradox that's supposed to make us sort of stop thinking. Uh, that's not that's not correct. Actually, it's not. That's not. The uh, is very clear in his writing. He's not just saying random paradox. You know, he's not saying up is down and down is up. You know, he's not he's not making up random paradoxes to make you stop thinking. He's saying something very specific there. Right? It's produced, but it's not inherently produced. Right. Um, and uh, Lama Tsongkhapa said. How could those of intelligence, he's talking to the Buddha, he's praising the Buddha now, right? And he says, how could those of intelligence not see that dependent arising is the heart of your doctrine? And he also said, for you, emptiness is seen as dependent arising. He says, these are not contradictory. So what does that mean? How can, because, um, well, anyway, so, so that's what we want to explore a little bit today, right? Because actually, uh, you know, I, I said last time there are many different, like, reasonings that one uses to contemplate in order to realize or meditate on emptiness. But actually it said that all those reasonings ultimately come down to dependent arising. So, like, you know, there are many different reasonings, and we'll explore some of them. We'll explore all of them, of course, in this series of classes, <laughs> since there are thousands. But we'll explore a few, and last week we explored one, right? Um, that it, uh, something of it is existent has to be one with or different from the aggregates, right? The self. That's what we explored a little bit last time. But even that ultimately comes down to dependent arising. But again, if, if you're saying how that doesn't make sense to me, good. That's the beginning point. That's a good start. Uh, and I want to say this too. Like, in other words, in one way it seems very simple, right? There is how what can be more simple than it's just one sentence, right? That which arises dependently is free of inherent existence. In one way that sounds simple. In another way, it's the most difficult. It's very difficult to realize that, to realize exactly what the Buddha's intent there. Um, 
And so, um, so I'm going to say a little bit more, and, and then, uh, and then we'll sort of have some back and forth. But I think to start explaining, so I want to say, say this too. So, in, in terms of dependent arising, right, that's what we're talking about now: dependence or dependent arising. Um, usually, the, there's the um, in terms of you could say actually these are in terms of subtlety, right? The different, you know, sometimes uh, there are different Buddhist. Uh, tenet systems, different ways of explaining Buddhism, different levels of subtlety of explanation. And so sometimes you can break dependent arising down into three or four different levels of subtlety. So I just want to use three today. Okay? I, want to, I, want to, I want to mention three levels of subtlety of dependent arising. And then we're going to start with the least subtle and we'll see how far we get. Uh, we get to the most subtle or not today. It doesn't matter. I mean, the goal is not to rush, it's to contemplate. But so I want to at least mention all three, right? So uh, three different levels. So a gross level of dependent arising is actually quite difficult, still not so easy sometimes, is dependence on causes and conditions. Okay. That's one level of dependent arising. That, um, so when the Buddha says that which is, um, that which depends on, uh, that which is dependent is empty and inherent existence, one, one meaning of dependent could be, right, dependent on causes and conditions. A second, subtler level of dependence right, is dependence on parts. So that a thing, you know, is a, so we're saying that for a thing to exist, it depends upon its, its parts in order to say it exists. And then this, uh, a third uh, very subtle level that we'll, I don't want to try to explain too much yet, we'll get to it, but is um, dependence on designation or on label or on name. Mm -hmm. And that one you can say is dependence upon the name or you can say it's also dependence upon the consciousness imputing a name. Right, so that, that's why you could say four if you want to. You can differentiate that out, and we'll get into that a little bit. But it's, uh, that, that part's much more subtle. You can see, right, even trying to think. With causes and conditions, we can say, okay. So I wanted to use an example in a minute. But, um, so those are three different levels, actually, right? So dependence on causes and conditions, dependence on parts, and dependence on, I'm just going to simplify it and say uh, a name. Okay? I'm not going to say the consciousness imputing a name also. But, you, I mean, obviously, it is implied, right? Names don't arise without a consciousness, or a, person, or a, uh, a mind, right, saying, uh, labeling, right? You don't have a label without a mind labeling. But, um, so in order to start exploring dependent arising, I, I figured I want to use an object today, not a person, right? So what's this? Apple. And where's the apple? In your hands. Yeah, it's right here, right? And what I want you to do is to notice, uh, Notice, there is introspect for a moment, right? As you're looking at the apple, right? Notice your experience of looking at an apple, right? So actually, it, it feel, right? it's in my hand, right? You can say, there it is. It's right there. And you have a sense, right? This is what's important. We're getting to the object. Remember I said last time, if you don't recognize the object of negation, right? Then you can't meditate on emptiness, right? So now I'm using not a person, but an object, right? Next time, it's a little easier to, to talk about. Right? And so, if you look at the apple, right? Like, there's a, a certain kind of, there's a certain feeling, and actually I want to say it too, uh, sometimes in, in uh, actually in, the, in uh, one term they use in some Buddhist texts is entity, nature, right? He talks about nature, right? Nature, and also, then there are attributes, right? So like, what color is the apple? Right. Yeah, it's not a, it's not one of those um, golden delicious, right? That's golden color. Right? <coughs> it's not yellow, right? So it's, it's a red apple, right? And it's what, a medium sized apple. It's not huge, but it's not tiny. So it has, and so it has a, it's, it's an apple, right? And then it has its own uh, qualities, right? And, and notice, actually, when, how you, when you look at that apple, right? You say it's right there, right? The feeling is it's right there, and I know what an apple is, right? And that's an apple, and it's there, right? And it's, uh, and, and actually, when you look at it, you think, and it's, uh, it, how, like, if, if, you, if I were to say, how many apples are in my head? One, right? And so you say it's a singular, it's singular, it's one thing, and it's there, and it's an apple. Right? And that's, a, that's an automatic, right? Actually, even your, when you see it with your eyes, even before you think, that's the sense you have, right? And then if, and then if you, we're exploring now, or, whereas ordinarily you wouldn't be thinking about any of this, right? You would just look, like if you're in a store, you say, oh, there's an apple, or somebody's walking down the street, so oh, look, I have an apple. Right? And it's, it's uh, that, that way of perceiving is, it doesn't require intellectual thought, it's innate, it's, it's habitual to us, right? It's, it happens automatically, that's the best way to say it. Right? 
And so automatically we see, because uh, he said empty of nature, right? So we feel, and actually, when you think apple there, right? When you think that's an apple. I'm just saying, exploring, actually, if you start to notice your own perception, which we, don't, we almost never think about this, right? But if you start to notice, right, so there's a sense of, of it's there, it's a thing, right? It's a thing out there. And actually, if you, um, depending on your own what's the word, dispositions and so on, right, like, you might, you, you, everybody might have their own associations, then, right? Like, um, either, oh, it's an apple, and you have a, thing, a feeling of, like, juiciness, and, oh, I like apples, or you might think, oh, I hate apples, right? Um... You know, I don't know, you're all, everybody has their own thing, right? These are all, th that's not the nature, right? There's a basic nature, appleness, right, that we see, apple, right? And then we have our own associations to that, right, that are sort of, uh, what's the word, grouped around that or something? Um, and so, so remember that way of perceiving, right? That you do with everything, right? Chair. I mean, you know, as we do with apple, we do it with chair, we do it with room, we do it with um, shirt, right? E whatever we perceive, we automatically, actually even our eye itself, right? Apple, right? And then our mind also, right? Uh, sort of says, yep, yeah, that's an apple. I know what that is, right? And so on. So now we're just going to explore the very first level of dependent arising, okay? And so... Um, let's see. It's a crisp pink apple. <laughs> I didn't know. Okay, but um, okay. So now we're going to explore the first level of dependent arising. Right? So if you so when you look at this apple, like you don't immediately think that's dependently arisen. Right? You just think that's an apple. Right? That's weird. nobody thinks that. Right? Nobody walks around and goes. Nobody like walks around and says, oh wow, it's a dependently arisen phenomenon. Nobody thinks that. <laughs> This thing is an apple. Either I want it, I don't want it, whatever. So then if we contemplate, right? Actually, so what are the... like? So first we're going to think of the... So we're going to ask the question, is this, uh, is this a self-existent apple? Or did this arise in dependence on causes and conditions? Now that's easy, right? When you look at it, it seems like it's just there, right? Singular, you don't think of it as dependent on anything. But if you start to contemplate this first level of dependence, this is very easy, actually, right? Or is this, this, this apple arise independent of a tree? Definitely not. We know that, right? Um, let's actually, let's just contemplate together for a moment, right? The, that first level of dependent arising. So you could say, actually, what, what's the... Um, so actually, you know, so what does an apple depend on to arise actually, on that level? If you think what causes and conditions are required for an apple to grow. Well, there's so many. Like a seed. Yes, yeah, so seed, it's, 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 seed light, is one. Water, soil, somebody to pick it. Yeah, and, and one thing that's a little disturbing, actually, right? I, I find if you actually think about it, right? Because as we say, our mind, I mean, just I'm just saying at the first level, now, right? <laughs> it's actually disturbing in a sense because when you, our mind sees see something very simple, right? Apple, there. Very singular, kind of just existent there, right? And you guys just started, right? But actually, it's disturbing if you start to think, because actually, like, as you started to imply, if you start to contemplate too much on this, right? Like, um, so, okay, so we could say, it, it, for sure, it depends on a seed growing into a tree, which never will happen without soil, right? And water, which, and also sunlight, right? So on a very simplistic level, those are the minimum requirements, right? Um, Actually, I have a question for you then. So the seed, right? So the, is the seed is a cause, and this is an effect? Is that correct? Well, wouldn't the cause actually be the combination of the seed with the nutrients, the thing that actually is, to say, activating it? Yeah, so actually, well, some, sometimes they talk about causes and conditions. You could say, sometimes they talk, when, in, uh, actually in Buddhism, when they say causes and conditions, sometimes the way they talk about it is this, is that there's a... a um, a substantial cause is like sort of the main substance that gives rise to the next thing, and then there are countless conditions or many conditions that are required for that cause to give rise to the effect, right? So, so you could say like um, I don't, you might say the seed or you might say the tree is, is sort of the, uh, but then it, then it requires many conditions such as sunlight, water, uh, person to pick it, uh, soil. Um, one thing that's 
uh, so actually, so, so then, actually think about, I want to ask you this though. So think about, let, let's say with the seed for an example, just an example for, for right now, right? So if you think of the seed of the tree that gave rise to the tree on which this apple grew, right? Imagine that seed for a moment. And if you imagine that, right, in relation to this apple, then you think, oh, that's, a, that's, that's one of the causal factors, let's call it that, right? That's a causal factor to give rise to this apple. So that seed was a causal factor, and this is a result. Is that, and then when you think of that seed, does, it seems like a, a, a cause, a causal factor, a cause, right? But this has seeds in it. Right? So are those results, or are they ca potential causes of future... Both. And this it is what be a, it would be an extension of because in order to actually create that seed came from the first original seed, which also could be, the tree can't exist without the seed, so therefore it can't be the seed, but it can't be the tree. So the seed is what actually started between the soil and the, and the nutrients that created the tree that created several apples. But then that, in order to even create that, it had to create those seeds. So it is also the effect, but because of that particular kind of effect, it therefore has other causes. And yet, and this is what I'm just noticing, right? When you, like, I'm just noticing, like, when, uh, I'm just getting at our perception now, right? So if you bought, I, I guess you have, um, if you've ever done this, right? If you bought a seed packet, right, for something, flowers or vegetables or something, right? And you rip it open and you pull out a seed, right? Like, because it's, you're going to plant it, right? Then you feel, oh, this is a cause. Right? It's going to be a cause because what you're wanting is whatever you're going to grow, right? And then you don't think of it as an effect. Right. At that moment, you're not seeing it as a, it is, of course, an effect of other of countless other causes, but you don't perceive it that way, right? You're perceiving it as a cause, right? Mm -hmm. And then, oftentimes, when we pick up an apple to bite it, if you think at all, we usually don't think at all about dependent origination, right? But if you do, you tend to think of it, oh, this is an effect, right? If you have, if you thought of that at all, right? And part of what this is getting at, right, is things are not, uh, in one sense, things definitely are causes and effects of each other, right? They have causal relationships. But um, a cause is only a cause in relation to its effect, right? And an effect is only an effect in relation to its cause. Right? So that's, they're mutually dependent. You see that? Mm -hmm. That's definitely true, isn't it? Um, so actually, and, you know, I don't want to go too far, but it's so now going back to the apple itself, right? Actually, like, so this is where it starts to get disturbing to me, right? Because I, I, when I look at it, I feel like there's just an apple. Then I, it gets disturbing if you think, well, okay, so the soil depends, actually, actually, for soil to exist, it depends on an entire planet, actually, really, right? Whereas if you just throw some soil up, and if we launch soil into space and, like, sent it out, nothing will, it's not, it, nothing will grow, actually, right? Um, so, actually, so for soil to function relationally in a way that can give rise to apples requires an entire planet and ecosystems, right? And actually, if you trace those back, of course, it requires the entire evolution of a planet, right? And then it also requires the evolution of genetic material, right? which is related, and then it requires the sun, right? And how did the sun form, right? And so you start to, what, go ahead. Okay. Oh, no, in ahead. the same sort of fashion of the collision of everything, which is those particular type of uh, uh, elements uh, were, to say, more nuclear, so therefore create the star, as opposed to the collision of the other type of material that form planets, and so therefore, in a way, because of that attraction to it, it became this sort of nuclear explosion of things, which is the sun, which, as we are going around it, it gives us, what created us, is that particular combination of the vessel. So now let's go back, exactly, yeah, so now let's go back, right? So I said, so we, um, which quote do we want to use? Let's see, let's see. I want to use this one. Whatever depends on circumstances is empty of nature. Right? That was what the Buddha said, right? I'm quoting the Buddha there. Right? Whatever depends on circumstances is empty of nature. Right? So the Buddha is getting at something, right? So in other words, when, you, when we first look at this apple, right, we have a certain idea in our mind. Because nature doesn't mean something outside of our mind, right? Well, nature here means that a way you perceive. He's not talking about nature like the natural world. Right? What the Buddha is getting at, right, is when we look at, when I look at this, right, I think this has a certain nature, appleness. Right? That there's like something appleness out there, right, right there. Right? So on this level of dependent arising, right, this gross level, right, 
actually, if this depends, right, on soil, on seeds, on stars, on uh, nuclear explosions, on um, a planet evolving, right? Like, is there appleness in any of those things? Like, is there, is there appleness in the sun? No. It's definitely not. Whereas if you look at the sun, you, you, that thing, that juicy thing that I want to eat is definitely not there, right? Like, um, if I, actually, I, I, like if you've gone to an apple orchard, right, and you dig in the dirt, you can't, you know, like, it, it doesn't have that juicy appleness to it, right? Even the bark, actually, if you try to eat the bark of an apple tree, it doesn't, it's not there, right? Like, and if you have a seed, just like just an apple seed, right? Actually, it'll just hurt your teeth, right? Doesn't that's not an apple, right? So actually, where is the appleness? It's actual thought of what <coughs> an apple or an apple. It's, it's the parts making an apple. Yeah. So we're getting, we're about to get to the parts. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, that was just subtler, right? Because that's what happens. Actually, what you just did is what happens, right? In other words, this is exactly what happens, right? Is that our mind says that's an apple, right? And there's appleness there in its nature out there, right? Then if you start just analyzing the first level, this is just the grossest level of dependent arising, right? And you say, uh, you know, because how can something that's not... How can something have a true nature of apple, right, if it came from all this stuff that's not apple? Right? Like, so then, because we want to say, but there's definitely appleness there, right, and we say it must depend on its parts, which is what the next step, right? But do you see how that first level starts to break that? In other words, you start to feel my perception of it's not that there's no apple there, right? But if you start to analyze dependent, this, depe this first level of dependence, right? It starts to challenge your perception a little bit. Like, right, if you start to think about the dependent origination of the apple, right, then you say, well, certainly it doesn't seem, it, it was, it, at first it just seemed like an independent apple, right, that's just there, right, when you just look at something. The same thing with this room, right? You look at a room and you say, it's just a room, right? Well, what, 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 if, what if it didn't have a name, what would you consider it? What's that? What if it didn't have a name, what would you consider it? Yeah. Yeah, so what would you? I mean, it's a good question, right? Name, because now you're getting at something very important. Name, right? It's an edible, maybe. <laughs> That's a name. Edible's another name, you say. What do you think? Well, the thing is, as, as, as infants and everything, you, you kind of throw everything in your, in your mouth. And so in a way, you find out that it's edible, possibly whether it tastes good or not. So you would find out whether it's edible, not necessarily, you can have a child and they, not, they would not be able to say this is edible. Mm -hmm. They don't know what edible means. Yeah. You know? So you can still explore and exist in the state of it being edible without actually having a name. Well, when you say name, you, you don't mean literally like language name, you mean a concept, right? Depends. I, wait, I didn't get to that yet. I was, I'm just talking about gross dependent rising. All I'm talking about is gross dependent rising. You guys brought up name, which is good. And I'm glad you guys brought it up, but I didn't get to that yet. I'm just talking about gross dependent But I'm glad you guys are bringing it up. To me, it's good. But you're asking a good question, right? So, or is, what do you guys, or is, let's stay with that. What does a person mean? Because there there's actually, what you're getting at is an interesting question, right? There's the literal name, apple, right? And actually, in what sense is this an apple? On people before us. Because that's, these are all things between, you know, names and, and uh, labels and even cause and conditions and what, what you know, uh, this is still dependent on, for instance, like us being born into other parents and teachers and people saying, apples are red and this, you know, I don't know why you're drawing this horse purple because horses are brown or white. <laughs> like we teach each other all this stuff. And so therefore we also have kind of limited <coughs> things to labels and things like that association in that fashion but when you started bringing up actually the last thing which was that to not actually kind of touch on which is funny is consciousness a vibration we would have known it was an apple and something because instinctively if we would have found out and like didn't have all these things taught to us it harnesses its own natural vibration of what is what it is 
And so one went, yeah, as we are, we do throw everything in our mouth. So we would have found out whether it was edible or not. We just would have found out whether we could actually live eating it or if it was poisonous and we die from it. <laughs> Go back to what you said. You said it, 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 about its own, it has its own what? Like you said, its own vibration yeah, of what like it is. Ev every, absolutely everything has a vibration of the existence of what it actually is. Its own, to say, consciousness, its own energy, its own uh, life force, and, and, you know. And so that's how we know the differences between, you know, jackets and hair and bodies and, and different species. A squirrel has a different vibration than us as humans, is a different than, the, than an elephant, and, you know, and water actually captures it, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Uh, and okay, so, so let me stay with that for a moment, because this is good. I mean, this is a great discussion, right? So, like, what you're describing, its own vibration, what you use. I think it's the same as I think it, one could use that would be another language for what he's saying nature right its own in its own uh, unique nature right that thing has its own unique nature right? that's in a way the same same idea right and which is great right that, you, that there is this sense because that's how we that's we feel so deeply that that's true right an apple has a nature and a room has it a room an apple's nature and then there's a, a nature of a room right um, and they have their own nature, their own vibration, their own uh, being, right, is the feeling. And on this first level of dependent origination, though, right, what we're exploring is, right, so so if an apple has its own being, its own nature, Whatever. Okay. How can it have its how, like? In other words, if it arose from all things that are not apple, okay, from tons of different causes and conditions that are not apple, then where did that nature come from? We do an infinite regression to the original causes. You're there, right? If we place ourselves in that place of an infinite regression. So you're saying the apple came from the Big Bang? No. No, I'm not saying but that. Yes, well, well, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that uh, the future becomes <coughs> a possibility of outcomes. So an apple arising is probably a random process that emerges through the combination of several factors then an apple emerges through a random act of combinations or what have you. If it were truly random, right, then should then why couldn't oranges grow on apple trees? It was random. Because it was consciousness. If you you funny because I see you started to say that and you said it comes from the Big Bang. If you think about it, yes. If the, if the Big Bang is what actually that explosion gave, gave birth to all materials, all elements that are possibilities, right? And so if, to say, energy, life force, existence within that, so you have, usually there's it and the lack of it, matter and to say dark matter, just not, right? So if everything was available to us, it, because of how everything had developed uh, in terms of the collision and how everything, you know, to create the universe and then break down more to our planet and then within our planet now. So now you look at, um, take for instance now your elements. So let's say you have hydrogen and oxygen. Because of, to say, the attraction of uh, like, whether it be um, like attracts like, or you have the collision of things that creates, creates fusions. So when certain elements that kind of, they start getting close to each other, they might either bond and connect or not. But I think consciousness plays one of the biggest roles that we don't necessarily take note of. Because literally everything that comes into existence, somebody thought about it mm -hmm. to make it happen. So that's where I would get connect sort of to say the randomness. It's not really to say random, but at the same time it is, because it's all based on these thoughts. Every thought that we have is another vibration that we're sending out into the universe, and so it's creating things. And so as it's creating things, we have the elements, at least what, what is available to us on our Earth, within this, this field. But at the same time, if you think about it, why, why also do we have so many universes that pop up and stuff like that? You have the birth and death of all these universes. 
because we're thinking of it. We are literally creating worlds. All of us who have had dreams and we create all these beautiful places and stuff like that, you actually are creating them. It's creating a whole other universe, a whole other planet, a whole other, you know. But we're also affecting our own planet with this, with our consciousness, our thoughts. Every vibration that we send out, we've created apples to exist. So you're saying that, that um, like, that, uh, Sorry, like that before there were humans on the planet, um, like paramecium formed because somebody thought of them. So who thought of them? Well, in a way, I would also kind of say for those who believe in God or want to bring in uh, certain religious, you know, in a way, those are the first thinkers. Or because someone from some other universe probably thought of us and thought of this and created our universe, but created it and, and turned into the pre and us. And it continues. So in a way, whomever, and it's just this, this sort of continuing existence. It's life force. You can't. It cannot be destroyed. It cannot be. So therefore, it just it just kind of keeps circling around. Just as the seed is not only the effect, it is the cause. So which is the nature of the seed? Effect or cause? Both. Well, I think. I mean, the whole point, right, is that. I mean, the whole. The whole discussion of emptiness takes place within our experience, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about our experience, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. And so, if you say, I mean, so the whole, isn't the whole point that that we are we perceive a world out there independent of us, and and um, r rather than the fact that we're creating the world, not. Not exactly like she was saying, but like that. Uh, that the that the world we experience is we're experiencing our mind, or, or we're experiencing our mind is projecting the world that we're experiencing. Not independent of, not completely independent of anything else, but I mean, because in, in terms of like Apple, I'm experiencing Apple because my mind is created the concept Apple. Is that kind of where we're going with this, or? Just say again what you were saying. I'm trying to make sure I get it right. I'm trying, I'm trying to make sure I know what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I think that You're saying that the mind is playing a role. Well, I'm, I'm saying... Yeah, I'm just going to make sure I get I'm it I'm saying, right. like, all this talk, like the Big Bang and all, and all, all yada, 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 it, it seems like you run into trouble when, when you're positing, you're positing a world. It, it seems like in these discussions, we're already positing a self-existent world outside of us. And then we're trying to fit ourselves into it, if that makes any sense. Um. But I think that the, the nature of reality is, in my judgment, is so complex that, that in order to comprehend it, to comprehend we have to filter certain things, and we have to literally construct a, it's a construct, uh, the reality that we create for ourselves. And of course the mind is the instrument we use for that. So you guys have gotten, <laughs> I've gotten ahead of ourselves. <laughs> a lot of different things, which is interesting. So you say oh. like, uh, the first part we say that, that it depends upon cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So how, so what does effect, what does it have to do with effect? How do you mean? I mean you say like, <coughs> like a, a cause and effect, right? So the, so the apple is the cause, is the, is the effect of what, the seed, right? So then what's the cause of the seed? So there has to be something there. Mm -hmm. So there's something there. So one thing Fidel is implying, right, which I think is an important point in this discussion, is that, um, you know, by definition, right, actually this is part of Buddhist logic, actually, right, like there's teachings, actually, so um, is that if, uh, so first of all, like we already said, right, an effect is only an effect in relation to its cause, right, mm -hmm. and a cause is only a cause in relation to its effect. That's clear, right, whereas that's, if we're using logic, right, you have to start with saying that's undeniable, right, whereas nobody can, um, that seems quite clear, doesn't it? Because uh, you, know, you can't posit something as an effect 
of a cause without positing the cause, right? One thing that, that what you just said implies very clearly, right, mm -hmm. is that if you think about that, if you just contemplate that, right, using reason right, and, and experience, it becomes clear that there's an infinite regression, mm -hmm. right? There's because where did the cause of that effect come from? Its own causes, right? Where did those causes come from? Their own causes, right? And, uh, and so one of the implications of that, right, mm -hmm. is that there's no effect without a cause, right? which implies an infinite regression, right, of um, causality, mm -hmm. right, That's, that has no beginning. No That's the Buddhist cause. There's no prime cause. Exactly. And actually, Nagarjuna himself, right, uh, you know, like, very, right, actually, there are a lot of um, Indian schools, right, of uh, philosophy that did posit, like, a, prime, a, a primal cause, an original cause with no, and um, actually, Buddhist philosophers, right, wrote many, Wonderful, clear, you know, interesting. Let's sort of say this um, refutations of that idea, right? In other words, that it's impossible to have a cause with. Uh, there was a, it's impossible. Uh, they used to call um, in Western philosophy there was that idea the, a prime mover unmoved, right? A cause that a cause that. And in other words, and part of the, the issue with that is, if something's related interdependently with other things, right? Then it's always it, by its nature, right? It has to be relational. Whereas anything that's, uh, that affects other phenomena is relational and therefore changes, right? And if it changes, it has to have its own causes. So that's clear. So is that's it, one thing. Is there a cause and effect up to you as well? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, the, are you, well, whoever. I don't know who's there. So, the, so that means then the apple exists. Yeah, nobody's denying the apple. No, Everybody because, can see I mean, an apple exists. But then are you, why, why are we arguing about it? Yeah, that's a great that's question. <laughs> That's a very good question. So, if it's like that, and then that's happening. The question, so on this, on this, let's keep going. Yeah, but so what we're getting we're at. Arguing how it exists, not that it, it exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah, 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 what we're discussing is how does the apple exist. Okay, right? okay, yeah. and, and part of the issue really is this, actually. Is, um, say it, it is a, uh, Is that we per, part of what Buddhism is asserting, or right, saying, right? Is that we perceive ourselves, right, and objects like an apple. We perceive them as though they existed independently. That's part of what it's getting at. But this is it's very difficult actually to to understand, like in other words, experientially, what is that really meaning, right? That you perceive yourself as if you exist independently. Um, and yet, you are, your nature is dependence. Right? That's what it's saying. And that we perceive apples as if they exist independently, but their nature is dependent. We exist, we perceive rooms and cars as if they exist independently, but their nature is dependent. So this is just one level of what we're talking about. So, so in other words, that's part of what Gabe said, right? The, the question is not do they, do cars exist? Yes. Right? But how do they exist? And so, um, and so you, you asked the question, right? You said, is cause and effect empty also? In itself, doesn't Nar Nargajuna talk about that? Yeah, he does. And, and the question would be, that, though, before one could even answer that, right? I, I think what's important is to recognize that, or is empty of what, actually, right? That's the really question. Is cause and effect empty, empty of what? Is it empty of existing? No, it exists. But is cause and effect, in other words, what happens is this is our habit. This is, I guess, this is really what Buddhist teaching is, is emphasizing. Is everything, you know, you said last time um, about, you said you quoted Lama Zoparim Shea, or paraphrase, saying um, everything we perceive is the object of negation, is the <laughs> phrase you used, right? This is what we're getting at, is um, do cause and effect exist? Yes, of course, right? In other words, that's obvious that they, they exist, right? But what happens is, even with cause and effect, much less with an apple or a self or a room or a car, but even with cause and effect, what Buddhism is saying is when, what Buddhist teachings are saying, what Buddhist teachers are saying, is when we look at cause and effect, right? Like, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, I, uh, I try to go to an apple orchard once a year, usually this fall, right? And, um, and when I go there, right, 
then I look at the tree, right? And I like there is I don't think I, it doesn't occur to me once the whole time I'm there, unless I'm unless I sit down and meditate, right? Uh, how that tree is dependently arisen. And, and if I think at all, right, if I think, oh, this apple came from that tree, right, then immediately I, this is what, it, what is it empty of? I'm just getting it experientially in a very simplistic way, right? I, I, I pull the apple down, I think, oh, this looks like a good one, right? And as soon as I pull it down, I think, oh, this one, then I, like, my, if I think at all about the tree, I think, I might think, oh, that, that tree is a good cause of good apples. I'm going to pick other apples from that tree, right? Because that tree is, an, is by nature a cause. I'm not saying all this in my mind, but... What happens is we reify, that's my point. We sort of su substantialize, and so we automatically think of this as, you know, so if we're, if we're looking at cause and effect as empty, this is the point, though, is that we start to see effects as inherently existent. This is a real effect, that's a real cause. And then the guardian is saying, they're empty of that. There is, that tree is not inherently a cause, this is not inherently an effect. So in other words, you have to see I guess my, how my you're reifying is, something. My point is, is, what we're really talking about here, correct me if I'm wrong, is... We're talking about empty of our concept of it, or empty of existing apart from our, our conceptual overlay of it. Because like the rest of the stuff we're talking about, I understand that that too is empty, it's, it's dependent arising in that way. But that's not much different than, I'm not saying it's not true obviously, but I'm saying it, it's, it's, it's not really much different than just a materialist causation of things, you know, which is true to a certain extent. But I mean, isn't that really what we're talking about? Isn't that what's going to transfer? It, yeah. Is our relationship to our, our the concepts in reality, isn't that what emptiness is talking about? The relationship between our concepts and or reality. like you know our, yeah. our consciousness in reality, like isn't that the big divide that we think that that emptiness is, is addressing or no? Well, let's keep going. Let, let's get to the second level of dependent arising, okay? Because I think this will also get at what you were raising in a minute ago. Yeah, that we keep saying we and I and <laughs> we detach ourselves from the cycle of things. Exactly. Yeah. We, we all into we all are an ecosystem that 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 is that is uh, a, a cycle of things. We're not. It's not me and versus that apple, or me versus the person next to me. It's we keep labeling ourselves separate from everything. Uh, if you die at the foot of that tree, you become the nutrients for that tree. The next entity that comes to eat from it, whether it be a sentient being, you know, he'll he'll eat that apple and nurture from it, which you are, which you are part of. So that's a good or, question. Or, or the entity that died there was a part of. I just use you know, so <laughs> you know, but but you know, if we if we keep saying that I, that this entity that I call I, you know, if we stop separating ourselves, we realize that we are really all one. Because, I mean, that's why the world is in the condition it's in, is because we keep treating it like it's a different entity. Yeah, yeah. and I think that that's because we, we have difficulty really, it's, it's putting everything into perspective. We can understand certain things on a certain scale, like if you were to take, um, you know, your insides and be able to understand why this organ affects that organ, affects this one, affects and how the flow of everything, we could sit here and pick apart a car and say, okay, well, if you replace this part in your car, you're going to need to replace this in a little bit because that's going to affect that and this and that. So we can seem to see it in so many different things, and then also depending on our own understandings, we specialize in so many different areas, which is why we usually kind of choose that area of work or something, right? So we can understand the connection to things and how, well, this is going to flow to that, which is what makes this come alive, which is make... And so, but I just think it's just literally personal perspective. I just think that we don't know really how we are actually truly connected to everything. Because every time you pick up your feet, you feel, well, okay, I don't have roots. I don't seem to be connected to the floor and to the ground and to the earth. You know, we, we don't see ourselves as being connected. And I think because part of it is also we're only seeing to the extension of, to say also our skin. We're only seeing ourselves as if we just come from here and we go out and we extend only out as far as our skin instead of considering to know like more of like our auras and, and things like that. To say there's there's an extension even past us, things like that. That's how we're all so continue to be connected to things. But so I think in some regards, because we can always walk around, we can always sit away from that person, we don't have to make contact, we don't have to we just have a much harder time really feeling like we were actually connected because we can understand, okay, well, my hair is connected to my head. 
we can understand something like that because it's like if I pull on it, it feels like it's still there, right? So we can understand something like that, but I think because we cannot, we can always let go, we can always pick up our feet and get off the earth, we can always, you know, move through the air and not think of it as something that is actually constantly <coughs> flowing through us and around us and constantly as a, as a thicker substance to say, things like that, as if air would feel more like water. So we feel disconnected even from that. So I think because we don't, we just simply don't have a perspective enough, the same way we could see how the car pieces all fit together and stuff like that, we just don't seem to have a perspective enough of our own actual connection. And so therefore, we can only think of things really as us, them, you know, what's <coughs> our country, instead of, no, no, no. Like all these things that keep us separate. We see the apple separate from us because we really <coughs> can't see how we're actually still already connected. As I am connected now to, to literally the particles that are be between me, between this jacket, between the chair, this gentleman, and the space between by the time I get to the apple, I know that I'm still connected to all the elements of everything up until that. that I don't think that's what we're talking about, though, is it? Because in my view, like mm -hmm. talking about like the the like the material causes, what you're saying is true. I'm not saying what you're saying is, isn't true, but that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about emptiness meditation. Am I but right? But isn't emptiness a thought connected also to so, the feeling? If so, can you say like also like? Aren't you gonna feel a little empty, a little disconnected? So, can you say like what we're talking about? Like you say like how how does it exist? That, can we say like you know in order to breathe? I mean, you need air to, to, to breathe. So in order to breathe, you need air. So without air, you can't. So the cause is that breathing is, I mean, if you want to be wealthy, you, gotta, you, 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 you do charity. If you do charity, you want to become, the result is wealth. So can you say that's so the same some, thing? Some level of what she's saying is dependent origination. Yeah, but we talk about the cause, yeah. We talk about the first one, the cause, how. Right. So, so if you. You know, for something to exist, it needs a cause, right? So that's what we talk about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I was talking about, in order to breathe, you need the air. So, yeah. I don't know why. But that's kind of like what she's saying, too. Because if you're thinking mm -hmm. empty, something like I mean, she's going going of, or just if yeah, it's like understand, emptiness, understand. like, why, why wouldn't we feel lonely if I feel disconnected? Here's my partner. If I feel like we're always here, this is this is going to feel very disconnected as opposed to literally to actually touching and things like that. So if you yeah, don't feel to connected that, that to your world, of course you're going to feel alone, a little empty. Like well, this is good. Let me come back now because I want to clarify some things. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, good that, so it's good that people are asking questions, so it's clarifying what the que you know what's not clear. So I want to clarify a few things. Now, right. So emptiness, right? Um, Emptiness means something very specific, actually. So I want to be clear, you know, and, uh, and um, so I want to be really try to make it more precise, okay? In terms of uh, what we're talking, you know, what Buddhism is talking about when it's saying emptiness. Right? This is a very important point. So, there is a uh, first of all, when we talk about emptiness in Buddhism, right, in the Buddhist context, like we're not. First of all, I, I think I said a little bit this last time. First of all, we're not talking about nothingness, right? We're also not talking about. We're not really talking actually at all about disconnectedness either. Um, and we're also not talking about meaninglessness. Nobody said that. I was clarifying. That's not what we're talking about either. Or is that that's a different? Or is a, those are not what emptiness is talking about. There's shunyata, right? Empty, empty is a translation of a Sanskrit word shunya, right? Shunyata, which ha, which in the Buddhist context, you know, coming from the Buddha and the Gargana and so on, has a very specific meaning. And so I want to clarify what that is. And, and I'm going to go back to the example of the apple, okay? Uh, just because I see that it's a simple example, right? So, there is when we perceive anything, and I'm just picking the example of an apple here, right? We, last time we used the example of ourselves, right? There is, uh, and when you feel upset, right? There was a sense of, um, of an I that seemed very concrete, right? And when we perceive an object, we perceive it as concrete, as self-existent, as truly existent. There are different terms that they use in Buddhism, right? So, I'm going to give examples here. When we perceive an object, we perceive it as independently existent, as truly existent, as existent by its own nature, or existent from its own side. And I'm going to use the existent from its own side. Now. And this is going to start to get at what you were asking about. So we perceive an object as if it exists from its own side there. Does that make sense? Or is that, that very clear, right? Simple, right? Whereas when we perceive something, we per so if I, look at, uh, if I look at the apple, I think it's right there. Whereas if I look at Fidel, I say he's right there. And I, I can point at him, and if I, if I walk away and tonight I think of Fidel, I'm going to have a very clear image, right? I'll think of him sitting on a cushion, you know, with a certain, you know, 
features that are different than Gabe's, right? I don't think that's Fidel. Right? And I think that's Fidel's nature, right? And I have a certain uh, what's the word? sense of him existing there from his own side. Does that make sense? I never think, you know, I, ne I never once in all my life have I thought, um, have I gotten confused and thought, maybe I'm Fidel and Fidel's me, right? Whereas I know Fidel's right there, right? I know an apple's right here. I never woke up one morning and thought, maybe I'm an apple today. Right? Whereas, so, it, or is, so if I look, and if, and if I look at my bowl and there's no apple there, I don't think there's an apple there, right? But if I see an apple, I think it's right there. And I think it exists from its own side right here, okay? Now I want to clarify what, what's the meaning of, so, and that's, so when we say inherent existence, sometimes in Buddhist terminology, they'll talk about inherent existence, right? Mm -hmm. But inherent means inherent, to the, inherent from the side of the object, right? It's inherent, it's in there, right? Or on there. Usually in there is the same. You know, Lama Zopa sometimes uses the term, he says it's right, it feels like it's um, on or in that, right? That either somehow there's an apple, appleness, where the apple exists, where in there, on there, somewhere over there, right? And so that's the concept. So, so I want to be clear, right? So I'm going to call it what, what should I call it? Inherent existence? Is that a good term? Does people know what I mean now? You feel it's there from its own side, okay? So I'm going to call that inherent existence, right? And so what Buddhism, what the Buddha is teaching, what the Buddha is saying, is not that apples don't exist, not that, um, and they're not even saying, what, the, what Buddhism is saying really is this, is that um, the inherently existent apple that I perceive does not exist at all. That's what Buddhism is saying. So, and that uh, that, that is empty of being an inherently existent apple. Right? right there, where I perceive an inherently existent apple, there's no inherent needs. It doesn't exist at all from its own side. Does that make sense now? So emptiness has that very specific meaning. Does that make sense? Um, which means we, and I'm now talking from the, just to be clear, I'm talking from the middle way school, because there are different schools of Buddhism. You know, but, uh, I mean, di not different schools, but different tenet systems, right? Different philosophical explanations. So the middle way school of, of, uh, of Buddhism would say, I perceive there to be an apple inherently from its own side right there, but right there, there is no apple inherently existing from its own side. So, so the uh, it's empty. That's it's empty of that. Does that make sense? So, first of all, I'm just making sure people understand the term. But now I want to explain why. Okay. So now we're using reasoning, right? And the, the whole point in Buddhism is not well. I say it's empty of that, so you should believe it, right? And then I've always perceived apples as existing out there, but they don't exist out there. That that's not uh, that's not what Buddhism is. That's not the point here, right? The point is, is this, is, let, let's do, let's, I'm going to use next the example of, of parts, okay? The emptiness, because, uh, emptiness, you remember the second level of dependent is dependence on parts? So the idea is this, okay? Is you start off, remember last time I said this, you start off by looking for the object of negation, right? So, okay, so whatever the object would be, whether it's my car, the house, but today I'm using the apple, right? Or, it's, or if I use Gabe, right? Gabe, Gabe seems to be this over there. But today I'm going to use the apple, okay? So the idea would be this would be, I perceive there to be appleness there, right? The inherently existent apple from its own side. Right? And this is going to get, it, it, I'm actually going to involve both of the next two levels, which is going to get it, what you were starting to ask about. But I want to be precise, okay? Because I want to be very precise about this, so people at least understand what, what, what Buddhism is actually saying about this. So, it, like, so, um, so the first was it came from causes and conditions. We talked a little bit about that, right? But now I want to analyze parts, okay? And so... The question is this, is, so you start to analyze, I, mean, I, I could actually do it, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to do it, I'm going to do it verbally. So, right? so if I were to peel the apple, right, peel all the skin off, which we sometimes do, right, and actually, I, I, if you've done that at home, right, you peel the skin off and you throw it, maybe you throw it in the trash, right? that's what I've done before, right? you know, if I'm going to make an apple pie, right, so you peel the skin off and you throw the skin in the trash, right, and then if you look and you say, is there an apple in the trash? No. Definitely not. In other words, nobody in the world would say, yeah, that's an apple. Right? You might say that's an apple skin, or that's skin from an apple. Um, and once, actually, and you watch your mind, actually, right? If you first peel it, and you throw it, right, and it still looks very fresh, there still feels like, actually your mind, right, still might sort of feel appleness, right? And then as it gets, you know, if you've ever watched it, as it get, just my experience anyway, I don't know if you're saying, but as it starts to get, like, wilted, and looks kind of gross after a little while, right, 
then you don't even feel like in reason, you know it's apple skin still right but you start to not it starts to not even feel like apple to you right but then you would look back and you say but the apple's here right you, so you peel the apple right you threw the skin away right and then watch what your mind does actually right does your mind see the skin and then you have the you have the whole apple there right but the skin's over there it's no longer a whole like, actually right so the parts right is there is the does the apple exist it, or is 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 apple skin an apple? No. And then now th this is uh, clear, right? So if you were to press out all the liquid, right? I mean, you do, people do that, right? They have apple uh, juice, I guess, the beginnings of apple juice. Um, you know, because right, if you put it into a thing and you, right, and then you have a bunch of liquid there, right? Is that liquid an apple? No. Right? And then, if you pull out the seeds, right? and then what are those little things around the seeds? Like those little uh, core. Yeah, the core, I guess you call it. Like, so if you just have the core, right? You have the seeds here, the core here, and then some, like, mush that you push the um, liquid out of, right? So you have three more parts there. You have the core, the seeds, and then the, some, uh, what's it called? Mush with no liquid in it. Are any of those an apple? No. And so the point then is this: is so. So you add, so we look through the parts, right? Those or is there something else? Is there another part of an apple? Maybe the stem. Or, if we threw that out, you know, that stem's not an apple, right? If you just have a stem, if you said, "Give me a give me a dollar in the store for the stem," nobody's gonna uh, <laughs> buy it. Right? And so, what we're talking about is this. So, you, so I mean, this parts one, right? Whereas, can you find an, the apple, right, that inherently exists an apple from its own side on any of the parts? No. Does the apple, an apple, exist apart from any of its parts? In other words, like, so like if I start a grocery store and I say, I'm going to sell you apples with the, that don't have any of those parts, right, mm -hmm. will you buy them? <laughs> it doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have a core, it doesn't have any juice, it doesn't have any peel, and it doesn't have any... Um, you know, uh, pulp or whatever. Like, there is, it doesn't exist apart from its parts. Right? In other words, if you, if you look for an apple that, uh, separate from the parts, right, it doesn't, you can't, it doesn't exist, right? If you look for the inherently existent apple, right, the example, apple from its own side, in the parts, you can't find it there. And so how does the apple, you know, now we, we didn't, so we, in other words, that's clear, isn't it, right? So then, now we're getting to the third level of dependence, right, which is what you were asking about, right? So we are getting into it today. <laughs> um, right, so what Buddhism is asserting, right, is that independence upon the parts of an apple, right? So this is dependent origination, right? Independence upon the parts, right, um, one labels apple. Right, if you speak English, right, then that's the label, right? Apple, right? But, right, so it does exist as merely, it depends upon designation, right? Whereas it depends on the parts. Now we're getting to the third level, so there's two, right? It, all three. Right? So it depends upon the parts and upon a label, right? The consciousness labeling it. Um, we can talk about an apple, and we can purchase an apple, and we can eat an apple. But is the apple findable? Does it, you know, is under under uh, analysis, can you find an apple from its own side? No, right. So the apple. So now you get to these strange sentences that sound. Remember, I said they sometimes sound paradoxical, right? So then you can imagine somebody saying the apple is empty of being an apple from its own side. Right? Now, if you if you just said that out of context, it would seem like some kind of weird paradox. Actually, it's not, right? It's just a fact of how an apple exists, right? Whereas we're not being paradoxical here, we're being accurate, right? Because actually, uh, how does an apple exist? How, in what way does an apple exist? It exists as something that's empty of being an apple from its own side, right? It exists, how does an apple exist? It exists, it exists as, as we say it exists. <laughs> well, actually, the, but that's tricky too because it, 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 I would say this: it, it exists independence upon the label, right? Not just because, because if you, if I say here's an apple, 
I'm saying it's an apple, but it doesn't. There's no apple, right? And there's there's no base. There's no parts, right? There's no base for the label. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it's still it's dependently originated, right? Whereas, whereas we can't just not just because we say if you say if I say anything I say, and of course like if I say this is an apple, right? Well, you'd say that he's insane, right? <laughs> because there's not parts there, right? So it requires uh, dependent origination. That's why we're talking about interdependent uh, dependent origination, right? So independence upon parts, right? Mm -hmm. And how do the parts arise? This is what we were getting at earlier. The, the parts arise independence upon causes and conditions, right? So that's why all three levels of dependent origination, there's, each one is subtler than the uh, previous one, but they're all true, actually. Just they're subtler levels of explaining how things exist, right? On a gross level, right, um, you know, one, it requires all those things, right? A planet with an earth and the sun and water and all that, right? Which you were raising, right? That's gross level of dependent origination. Then, on a more subtle level, right, even, like, it seems like it exists there from its own side, right? But actually, what's happening, right, is that it, how does it exist? In, it dep in dependence upon label, right? And the label has to be... Uh, and the label being, uh, what's the word? Said in relation to, let's call it that, right? Parts. So do you see how it's dependent, right? In other words, um, the, but when you think, actually, this is the point about emptiness, though, right? Still, we can't stop almost, right? Whereas unless you're analyzing it, right in the act of analyzing it, it seems so much like the apple exists out there. See? Uh, in that there's some appleness. And as you were that there's some vibration, that there's some thing out there that is that, right? A car, like, if you think of your car, right? It seems like there's some vibration, there's some nature, there's some thing there from the side of the object that is that object. What Buddhism is saying, right, is, let's use the parts and the label, right? All there is, right, there's what exists, right? There's the appearance of parts, right? You can't deny that, right? There's an appearance, right? And then there's a label, right? Car. But there's abs there is there what there is and then we perceive it as though there's a car there in the car right? that's as a carness there's a there it has its own entity its own nature and what Buddhism is saying is check analyze it go through every part if you take apart that if you take apart your car and put all the parts all over the garage you won't find anything in it uh, that corresponds to what you feel exists out there right. But there, are, there is the appearance of parts, and there's a label, car. And based upon that, and so this is the tricky part, right? Sometimes, like Lama Zopram, she would say, how does it, things exist in mere name, mm -hmm. right? That's what he says, right? In mere name, right? Merely label, mm -hmm. right? But there has to also be a base for the label, right? Um, but as soon as we say base, actually, this, you check, watch your mind, actually, right? Your mind will want to reify and say there's something real there from its own side. That's what we do, actually. We can't help it, right? And so, like, I just want to give one more, yeah, we have time. Give one more example. Like, like take Gabe now, right? Because a, a person is more visceral than an apple, right? So, like, there was when you say, when I say uh, Gabe exists right there, right? That seems more important. Actually, uh, it's the same. And in one sense, it's the same as an apple. But in another sense, it's more important because it's per we feel like it's more important as a person. And so, like, um, and so if you say, like, like, there's no Gabe existing from Gabe's own side. Okay, I mean, how does that feel? Right? Gabe is empty of Gabeness. <laughs> like, what does that mean, right? And so you have to ask, right? Okay, so that Gabe arose from causes and conditions is obvious, right? He had a mom. I mean, there was a, we can we can deduce pretty easily that Gabe had a mom and a dad, right? And that Gabe ate food. And went to school, uh, and you know, so on, right? Because he had a body. Right? But let's get to the second level, right? So, in other words, when I look at Gabe, when you, look, I'm just picking Gabe. Do you mind if I? Use you? <laughs> okay. Uh, right. So, when you look at Gabe, right? For sure, you feel there's a guy there. Right? There's this guy sitting there, right? and it feels like there's something substantial, right? That's there, a substantially existent, inherent Gabe, Gabe, right? Inherent person. For sure it feels like that, right? There's an, of course there's an inherently existent person there is how it feels, right? But then, like, we can do the same analysis, right? There is, does Gabe exist 
you know, in other words, if, can you find that, there is, you have to identify the object, does that make sense? You have to identify that sense of inherent existence. That's the important thing here, right? That sense of like, that he really exists there, right? And then you analyze, right? Well, does Gabe exist on his left nostril? Is Gabe findable on a left nostril? No. Right. Is Gabe findable on an earlobe? No. Right. Is Gabe find you know, it, or is, can you find that Gabe, right, on, like, any one part, right? Like, you know, on his heart, right? No. Right. On his lungs, no. Right? Uh, on his happiness, or his anger, or his peacefulness, or his whatever emotions he has different days, right? Is, is any of those inherently gave? No. Right. Even consciousness, right? We did this last time a little bit, right? Is game findable on consciousness? No, actually. Right? Whereas actually, uh, Buddhist analysis, right? Consciousness itself, right? We talked about this a little bit last time. Right, right, um, there was a, consciousness itself is made up of parts. Right? There's yesterday, uh, temporal parts. Right? Whereas actually yesterday's conscious, there was like even uh, this morning's conscious, when Gabe first woke up, right? Is Gabe findable on that? Actually, that doesn't even exist anymore. Right? Is Gabe findable on this evening's consciousness? It's not existent. Right? There is Gabe, this evening's consciousness is not an existent phenomenon. So, of course, Gabe can't exist. Not, if Gabe exists, it's not on something that's not existent. Right? And actually, we try to find the present moment. Right? Is he, like, is, does that inherent Gabeness exist on this moment's consciousness? Actually, when I said this, that moment's already passed. Right? So then Gabe would have gone out of... If Gabe were inherently existent on that, then Gabe would have blipped out of existence. By the time I, as soon as I finished saying this, right, Gabe would have been somehow inherently existent, then he would have blipped out of existence because that moment passed, right? And now that moment doesn't exist in this moment, right? So he can't be inherently existent on any given moment of consciousness, right? And so if you meditate like that, right, the point is, it's like you come eventually, right, if you keep searching, right, and you, if you do an exhaustive search, does, does Gabe somehow exist separate from his mind or his body? Right? Can you find a Gabe, right? Actually, like, then, then when I walk, like, if, I, if I'm going to come to class, right, and Gabe's not here that day, I should be able to say, oh, here's Gabe, right? It, it, it was, why do I say Gabe's here? It's because his body and his mind are here, right? Or is that otherwise I should be able to walk outside and go to the restaurant and say, oh, Gabe's there while he stays here, right? right? We always, it always, but so what's the point? The point of this, right, is how does Gabe exist, right? In dependence upon those parts, we label person, we label Gabe, right? And Gabe exists in that way as merely labeled, right, on, on um, the basis of designation, or on the parts. Right? But there's, so that, in other words, but there's nothing inherently there, right, on the base that's gave. Not one speck, right, not even an atom, right, not one atom, not one organ, not one cell, is inherently gave. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think if I'm following, if I can use gave too. <laughs> if, if, if I, I guess I, I would judge gave somehow by appearance. If I spoke yes, to someone right. over the phone, I lose that reference point. So all I can judge is by voice and by sound. But then if gave loses his childhood memories or, or his memories of who he is, then I can't communicate with him on anything about himself, so I have only his essence, because now we don't know who he is, what he is, what he has been, so I have the essence of Gabe. And what Buddhism is saying in part is that that idea you have of the essence of Gabe, Gabe's not that. that in other words, that's, your, that's completely, um, you could say that's a fiction, actually. Whereas that, that I have this idea of, a, of an essence of Gabe, and that essence of Gabe, uh, that, yeah, that essence of Gabe doesn't actually exist. That essence of that entity there. That also doesn't, that essence of that entity there also doesn't exist. That's what Buddhism is asserting. It's a radical assertion, right? That, the, there is, that even if you stop using the name Gabe, right, we say that entity there, or that being there, right, that that essence of that being there doesn't exist at all. It's not, Gabe exists in your name upon the base and the label, but there's no, there is, the essence that I think is there doesn't exist at all. Right there, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Can, I, can I just take a quick shot at it yeah. and tell me, if, <laughs> tell me if this is right or wrong, okay. if this is what we're saying? All right, so 
the gayness. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous. The gayness. <laughs> I'm, I'm, producing the gayness basically. So my the gayness that I'm experiencing. <laughs> it's your gayness. It is it is coming from me. And basically, what we're saying with emptiness is because we have the feeling. All right, like I mean, that's that's obvious in a certain way. Like the way I feel about him, you know, whether I like him or don't like him or whatever, you know, whatever my experience with him is produced by my own conditioning, my own karma, you would say, or something like that, in, in a large way. But so, so is what, we're, what we're saying, if I'm correct, is that, but we feel like, well, there's, there's a way that Gabe really, like, there's the real Gabe, and then there's how I'm, how I'm seeing Gabe. But we're, what we're saying is that there is no true, there is no real Gabe. And that, so that, and, and that goes for everything else, too. So everything I'm experiencing, the way I'm, exp the, the way I'm experiencing and what I'm experiencing is coming from my own conditioning, my own karma, and so you, so so we change our karma, and then we change what we experience. Is that what we're pretty much saying? And what you're experiencing comes from your own karma. That, I mean, in a sense, you know, you, we are. I mean, definitely an implication of what we're saying is that if you change your karma, then what appears to you will change. If you change, no way of saying that. It's just this: is if things depend on causes and conditions, right? Karma is one of the causes and conditions. So if you change the causes and the conditions, then the appearance will change for sure, right? Um, you know, in the same way, if I, if I if you rip out the apple tree and you plant the pear tree there, yes, for sure, then then the appearance will eventually be pears, right? So that's true. Um, I'm just trying to get a feel but, of, like, sometimes it gets so abstract of, like, w what does this actually mean for me, you know what I'm saying, like, in terms of my own... <laughs> Yeah, so one way of saying it is this, is like, so what, one thing it means, me. what about me? <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to come back into the picture? <laughs> Talk about me, though, please. <laughs> well, actually, let me but it. you don't exist. Exactly. Yeah, so forget about it. Well, he, well, actually, he does exist. I'm the only one who does exist inherently. <laughs> well, actually, he exists in your name. But well, actually, let me ask you a question, though. Give me an example of something that upset you in the last few days. Um, could be a small thing, doesn't it? Give me an example. Uh, not being able to find something to eat, not being uh, my food being gone, or something in my house, or whatever. <laughs> and so, and then, how did you feel when you couldn't find something to eat? Frustrated, annoyed, and hungry. hungry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you felt like frustrated and annoyed, right? Think back to that moment. Right? This is what we're getting at, really, in a, on a practical level. Right? Think back to the moment when you felt really frustrated, the most frustration and annoyed in that, in that instant. Right? And, and try, to, try to put it, into, just very briefly, put into words your, the, the sense of how, who you, or is, that, or is that what I'm trying to get at is this, is, is in that moment, for you, for sure then, right, there was a sense of, an, of a, the word, I'm going to use the word we were using earlier about the apple, an inherently existent mat, mm -hmm. right? a true mat, a real mat. Right. Who really wanted uh, food, food right? <laughs> and and so there was a sense of there was a clear sense of um, and actually you had a feeling that there should be food there in the fridge right? Uh -huh. also right. So there was a sense of um, I'm inherently existent here right, and food should be inherently existent there but isn't and I'm angry about it or upset about it right. And so on a real on a just very practical level right, this is what happens right. So there's a sense of I really exist in, inherently right here. Right from my side, and food really exists or should exist really inherently out there, right? And and actually, this is exactly this is why we're getting it. This is I mean, you're asking a very good question because this is why we're bothering to talk about emptiness, actually, right? Is this is because you have that sense, right, of an inherently existent, independent I, right, inherently existent in here, and then inherently existent other, right? Then, right. What happens naturally, always, actually, we can't help it. As long as we have that, right, it's going to eventually happen, what, what ex you experienced, right? Where we're going to feel, actually, right, this inherently is an I wants uh, something, right? So we give rise, in other words, this is how Buddhist psychology describes So we give rise to a sense of, like, Gabe, I was using Gabe, now we're using Matt, right? So Matt, based on, in other words, all there is is, is um, what we said earlier, right? How does Matt exist? There's the mere appearance of parts, right, of a basis of designation, and then a mere label. That's not how you experience yourself, though. You experience like an inherent, real mat, madness. Now I'm going to say, madness in there, right? 
and not a game this anyone else. Right? Sounds like madness. I know. Madness. <laughs> That's probably closer to the truth. <laughs> what's really going on? So. Right? And then this is the problem, though, right? Is actually as soon as we give rise to an inherently existent, right, uh, truly existent, uh, in there it's real, right? We feel that, right? Uh, oh, there is always eventually. There is. It's always going to give rise to afflictive emotions. That's the problem, right? So then we're going to think, I want food. Then we're either going to say, um, and then every, actually this is how Buddhist psychology describes what happens, right? So then, either, right, we don't get food, right? We can't find it, right? There's nothing in the house. Whatever. So then, right, uh, that gives rise to uh, upset, right? You know, then if somebody, like if we, I'm going to elaborate for a moment. If, if we get food, right, then we say that's mine, right? There's inherently is in me, right? And then there's an inherent existence in mine. Actually, I gives rise to the sense of mine. Right? Then if somebody takes your food, right, then you're going to be angry at them. Right? If somebody gives you a bunch of food, right, then you're going to become attached to that person. Like, like I said, or is a, if you, um, you know, somebody starts coming by and saying, oh, if, if a, I'll, I'll predict something. You know, if, if, um, that's what I was if some beautiful woman starts bringing you lots of food and, you know, every day, then he's like, oh, wow, I really like her. Right? Then you're going to become very attached. <laughs> oh, she's giving me lots of food. She's a good cook. And it's beautiful. And I really like her. Right? And then you become very attached to her, right? You know, and then, um, and actually all that is dependent upon I and mine. Do you see what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. And so once you become attached to this sense of, an, of a truly inherently real I in there, right, which doesn't exist actually, right, but it's, it's an illusion, it's an it's a, it's a incorrect superimposition, an incorrect mm -hmm. idea, right? Because all that exists, as we said, is a mere appearance, right, of... Dependently, or you know, based on causes and conditions, there's the appearance of parts, and then there's label. Right? But then you add something to that, right? You add the sense of truly inherent existence. Right? We all do. Just, since you asked, this example. Right, I admit it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so based upon that, right? And then, like, actually, like, if you think of the sufferings of samsara, right? They all arise dependent upon that, right? Actually, what you're describing is part of the list when they talk about the, uh, you know, the uh, was it? You know the ten sufferings of samsara, right? There's you know there's lists, right? Hunger, thirst, you know wanting but not getting, uh, you know uh, working to get things, right? Then getting them but becoming dissatisfied with them, having things but having them taken from you. I mean, there's an endless list of suffering, right? But all of those arise in dependence upon, right? This sense of an inherently existent I, and then inherently existent other that I either want or don't want, right? Then sometimes somebody gives you stuff you don't want, they think. From me, you know, whatever, and so on, right? But all of that arises in dependence upon the sense of an inherently existent I. Um, so that's the relevance to you in terms of direct experience, really, is, is, um, is this actually, it, you know, um, is that if, uh, when a person, right, this is a Buddhist, this is the basic Buddhist teaching, which you have the Four Noble Truths, right, if you go back to that. What Buddhism is saying is this, is if you can realize in your own experience, right, that that inherently existent mat doesn't exist at all, right, which means mat's a mere dependent, right, merely labeled, mere dependent origination. Um, so you, you start to, the, to the extent that you, so you say this, overcome or Recognize, actually, put it this way, you go back to the word emptiness, right? There is, so right there, right? Like, right, right there, right? If you start to realize right there that there is no inherent now, right? If you actually start to contemplate that and realize, even intellectually, and then if you realize that meditation is different, of course, but then what's going to happen? Right? And this is the relevance, actually, right? Is that then, right? Um, yes, you relax. Voidness. And you start to, that, that, yeah, voidness means though, right, that, that um, the parts are void of mat, right, a void of an inherently existent mat. There's no mat there from its own side, right, so that if there's no mat there from its own side, right, then the aggregates, let's call it, right, the mere appearance of the aggregates, right, that are immediately labeled, are void of a mat, right, that exists from its own side. Mm -hmm. And if mat starts to realize that, right, then... The craving right? mm -hmm. uh, and grasping mm -hmm. and dissatisfaction and anger and you know hatred and fear and jealousy and 
you know, all those other afflictive emotions start to decrease and eventually you're utterly, and this is the key actually, other things can decrease them, right? But only, the, the Buddhist insight is that only this insight into the voidness or emptiness can destroy them from the root because that's the root cause of all those afflictive emotions. That's really the relevance to your experience. Mm -hmm. So like Lama Zopa says, actually, so there's a quote, uh, I saw, uh, a quote where he says, um, he says, the wisdom, you know, this wisdom understanding emptiness is like an atomic bomb um, that destroys the afflictive emotions, right? Um, it was just the ultimate weapon against our own, you know, because like Buddhism says, you know, there are no, there's no, uh, Buddhism says don't look, for, there's no outer enemies, the real enemies are within, their own afflictive emotions, right? So you can calm, whereas if you just focus on your breath, right, if you're really angry and you focus on your breathing, well, your anger will decrease a little bit, of course, right? You know, it's like you stop, you know, maybe, hopefully, if you really focus hard on your breathing, you know, you're really feeling very angry, it starts to calm you down a little bit. But then you go back outside and somebody does something, and again, the anger is back, right? You know, same thing, right? If you're craving a lot, and then you go and think, okay, I've got to crave less, I've got to crave, you know, maybe it decreases a little bit, then you go back, and then it comes back, actually, right? That's the problem. I mean, there's all other, any solution is better than having more of the two emotions. But that only this wisdom, right, that, pers that, that comes to understand that the inherently existent map, and that there from its own side, doesn't exist at all. Right? Only that uproots the root cause of all those afflictive emotions. And so if you contemplate that over and over again, right, then the afflictive emotions will be destroyed, actually. Uh, and then you achieve liberation. You know, so when the, when the Buddha said, um, right, uh, the, the, um, the third noble truth, right, there is cessation, right, there is a cessation of suffering. This is exactly what he meant, right? So, on a, I mean, that, that's a very exalted state. But even on a very practical level, that's why Lama Zopa was saying that. He said, even just remembering emptiness, even intellectually, right? Our, and that, that was what, last time I quoted uh, Arya Deva, who said, even just having a doubt, right? Arya Deva said, even having a doubt tears samsara to shreds. Right? That doesn't mean, what that really means is, you know, like, what was Arya Deva getting at, right? It was like that really starting to contemplate seriously emptiness, right? There was really starting to contemplate the our own, uh, the emptiness of a truly existent man, right? And starting to get, well, actually, well, one commentator on that verse said that, that R.A.D. was referring to doubt leading in the right direction. First of all, you're really getting, uh, it wasn't just any doubt, it was like a doubt, you know, it was a doubt that, that comes from deep contemplation. In other words. Um, that your suffering, if I'm sorry gets teared to shreds, just means your own suffering gets teared, right? So I'm sorry is not something outside you, so I'm sorry is your own experience. Mm -hmm. So that's the practical part of it, is that if you really start to contemplate this, if you start to Identify, wow, like when I'm starving and I'm really upset and I'm feeling frustrated, like I can see, this is what we were doing last time actually, that you can see the object of negation then, right? And, uh, not Apple, not, not an Apple, but in yourself, which is the most important object of negation actually, right? So actually what, the best thing you can do is like, you know, so you open the fridge, right? This is what we were doing last time actually, we were getting at this. This would be the ideal meditation, right? You open the fridge, you feel really upset, right? Oh, there's nothing in there. Right? Leave the fridge open, sit down, you know? And like, <laughs> and say, okay, this is the object, like, this I that wants something to be in there, that's the object of negation, negation right? And then, and I feel it so strongly, like, like right here in front of the fridge, I would feel it very strongly, actually, right? Like, I want something, and really I wish it was this, whatever you're, you know, like, I wish it was there, right? Like, and why isn't it there? And I thought it was there, and especially if somebody else ate it when you didn't know that would really bring it up, you know? That'd be good, you know, but then what you do is you search then. Then you do the analysis we're doing, that I was doing on the Apple or on Gabe or on, right? Then you say, that truly existent map. That I feel right now, I feel very 100% is there. Like uh, Lama Zopa says, when you, if you're in that moment, he says, it feels as solid as the Rocky Mountains, mm -hmm. you know, as real as the Rocky Mountains. And it does, actually, right? And then you say what we just did, right? Because now it's no longer an intellectual exercise, right? You say, in what sense does that exist, right? Does it exist on, I, I, I'm hungry, maybe it exists on my stomach, right? And then you think of a stomach with acid and this disgusting <laughs> organ. You think, is that, a, is that mad? Clearly not. That's, that's some is gross. It, isn't this how you are choosing to respond when you open the refrigerator? It's like you can might as well say, "Oh well, uh, let me put my coat back and let me get something to eat." Yeah, and what I'm suggesting is this: is like um, this is actually uh, yeah. So yeah, of course you can do that. But what I'm suggesting is this: is if you say, "Okay, I'm going to go get something to eat," right? Then what you what you cure is the momentary hunger. But if Matt were to sit down in front of it with the open fridge and meditate like that, right, then what he's curing 
is samsara itself, right? I mean, is he starting to cure? He's, he's taking a real, um, an atomic bomb, you know, one missile, you know, that's destroying the root cause of samsara itself. Is he going to, you know, achieve full enlightenment while sitting there in front of the fridge? Probably not. Maybe. Uh, maybe <laughs> so. He did, he's so does it. But that's, you say, I mean, this is a skillful, this is why, like, and I'll just say one more comment, then I'll get, like, um, this is why sometimes I, I reflect on this. Like, you'll see where, um, I think I saw this with, with um, it's an interesting question what you ask, because sometimes you see Lama Zoparimji, right, where he'll, like, uh, for example, they'll be on a flight, right, an international flight, and they bring the food out, right, and everybody else starts eating, right, and you'll see Lama Zopa meditating, right, the food's in front of him, and then sometimes Roger will describe, his attendant will describe, like, Lama Zopa meditates so long that finally they take the food away, they say, oh, we're, we're landing, and they take, and he says, and, and like, and like Roger would say something like, um, I don't know the exact quote, but basically he would say something like, you know, they took the food, you didn't, you know, you didn't get to eat it or something, and, and Rimshaw would say, I got the essence. Yeah. of what's important about that food, which was meditate, which was this. So, I mean, I'm not saying don't eat, you know, and I'm not saying don't go to the store, but, but you can see, like, he's teaching it. And there was, like, I'm, so I'm just giving an example. So that's the benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the use of this. But, yeah, go ahead. So does, like, a pride exist? Pride? Yeah. So same thing, right? Mm -hmm. There was, yes, of course, I mean, pr does pride exist? Yeah. Uh, of course, it arises, right? There's this appearance of pride. But if you analyze, right, as pride by obviously right it has to depend upon the that um, ignorance grasping at a truly existent self right mm -hmm. whereas how can somebody feel pride right because what happens there right mm -hmm. so you feel right you, you start first you have the um, the perception there is the uh, the wrong perception of a truly existent inherent I right mm -hmm. and then what happens there's there's inherent there's an I and there's inherent there's an other right and I want to say, too, because what you said, I want to be clear, Buddhism not, doesn't say, actually, I and other are one. That's not the Buddhist view. Right? What Buddhism is saying is the I exists in mere name and other exists in mere name. Neither exists inherently. That is the difference between saying they're the same, right? But if you say they're the same, that would be another superimposition, actually. If you say they're truly the same or truly, if you say, if I say me and you are the same exact person, mm -hmm. that's not correct, right? If I say we're inherently different, right? inherently, di we're, we're merely labeled we're different, Right? We're labeled differently. Mm -hmm. We're not, but we're not inherently one. We're not inherently other. Can you say we're interdependent, though? Yeah, we're interdependent. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. But then, in terms of pride, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens then, right? So I say there's an inherently existent me, and an inherently existent Fidel, mm -hmm. right? And then what happens, right? Then out of once you once we assert that, then all the afflictive emotions start to come, right? So I start to feel, well, um, you know, Fidel, like I start to feel insecure then. Right? which is part of the nature of having an inherently existent eye, because it's going to be insecure, because it, actually, of course, if you're believing in something that's not true, you're eventually going to feel pretty uh, insecure. Um, right? And then I start to say, well, I think I'm better than Fidel. You know, um, you know I'm whatever. Uh, I'm this and I'm that, and I have better quality than him. Right? Um, right? It, but in other words, if I didn't have that view of an inherently existent eye, I wouldn't give rise to pride. Right? Mm -hmm. But once you have that view of an inherently existent me, right, then, like, I want to somehow, you know, that, that comes out, then comes all the self-cherishing issue, right? I want myself to seem like the best. I want myself to seem like the smartest or the handsomest or the whatever, richest or the, whatever the person is attached to, right? And that's where pride starts to come in, right? Where then the person says, I'm better than this person, I'm better than that person, I know more than them or I'm handsomer or I'm richer or I'm whatever the thing would be, right? Prettier. But you see, so that's where pride always depends upon that wrong view. Does that make sense? So we should... Uh in the, if you that thing that cause pride to arise, it, is, it destroys it, and then there's no, it can, pride can arise. Yeah, so if somebody destroys the grasping at a truly existent inherent I, mm -hmm. right, then pride will, by its nature, it's like um, you've destroyed the root right, of it, oh, wow. so it can't arise anymore. So does that thing also have something that it depends on? Yeah. Okay, so it continues to. What? The thing that it causes inherent existence. To exist, it depends upon something else. You mean the view of inherent existence? No, no. I mean, like, they say pride, pride depends upon uh, true existence. You say that? Pride and depends it, upon the ignorance grasping at true existence. So and then ignorance grasping at true existence depends upon something else. On the previous moment of ignorance grasping at true okay. existence, which depends on the previous moment okay. of true grasping. Which, and so ignorance grasping at truly existent at true existence mm -hmm. is also a dependent arising, mm -hmm. okay. which is why, and the guardian points this out, which is why it can be destroyed. Right? Uh -huh. Whereas if it's dependent upon causes and conditions, uh -huh. right? anything that's dependent upon causes and conditions, if the opposite causes and conditions uh, happen, 
then it gets cut off. Mm-hmm. And one thing I'll say, too, is interesting in Buddhist philosophy, they point this out. Like, true, this is why I asked you carefully. You said true existence, and I said, you mean the ignorance grasp? But I want to say why I asked that. Is, I, I thought it was an interesting point in Buddhist philosophy. The inherently existent I doesn't exist at all. Right? It's, it doesn't true, it's not existent, actually. It's, it's something that, but the mind grasping an inherently existent I uh, does exist as a dependent reason, right? Whereas, like, you know, the same way, like, if you say, um, if you say a psychotic person sees a, you know, pink elephant walking through this room, right? The pink elephant doesn't exist at all, right? But the psychotic person's idea of a pink elephant does exist, right? It's a, it's a wrong idea, but it exists as an idea. You see? So the same way, the truly existent I doesn't exist at all, but the mind that, the ignorance that grasps at it mm-hmm. is a dependently arisen phenomenon. Does that make sense? That we have to destroy and the only way to destroy it is is the name. So now we get to what was the name of the class? The series of classes is called the wisdom of emptiness, right? So it's only wisdom understanding the emptiness of. And I want to say this too. This is why it's very precise in a way. The Buddhist Nagarjuna's tradition on, on emptiness teaching this is a really important point. I think is this is that um, so the ignorance, right? That that's why I was trying to be very clear. What that what is that ignorance grasping an inherent an inherent I, right? Or inherent apple, or inherent Gabe, or inherent Matt, or whatever, you know is that if that's the root cause, right, that's the root cause of suffering, is ignorance grasping at a truly or inherently existent person, right, or things, right, then the antidote to that, right, if that's a, because that's an existent phenomenon, right, I just said, like, in other words, the ignorance itself does exist, right, it's a mere, it's a, it's a dependent or arisen phenomenon, but it exists, right, because it depends upon its previous moment, then what Nagarjuna was pointing out is that uh, you have to have the exact antidote to that if you want to stop that. Does that make sense? Nagarjuna gives an example. He says, he says if there's a thief in your western, I think they were just, or Lama so compliments, I can't remember which one, but there's a thing where he said, they say, um, you know, if there's a thief at your western door, right, and you go, uh, you know, and you go to guard the eastern door, that's not going to work, right? And so we have to know exactly what's the ignorance that we're trying, you know, the same thing like Lama Zopa's metaphor, where he says, Wisdom understanding emptiness is like a nuclear bomb to destroy right, uh, the afflictions. So the problem is this: is if you if you if you don't understand what is inher- what is the ignorance grasping inherent existence, right? Then you're going to be refuting something else, right? And then it won't get rid of, the, you know. And then you'll say, well, gosh, my afflictions aren't getting better, right? But it's because it has to be an antidote to that. Does that make sense? So you have to find in your own experience. Like, you know, like when you're in the front of the fridge, that's why at that moment. You, right, in the front of the fridge there, you find your own experience of the truly existent. Ignorance grasping the true existence, right? And then you use reasoning, right? That's what Buddhist meditation is in this way on emptiness. And all, the, all Buddhist meditation on emptiness uses reason, right? So then you use reasoning to refute that, right? Until you realize, on some level, wow, like, that truly existent I that wanted whatever hamburger or something like it doesn't exist at all right it doesn't exist at all does that make sense you see what I mean? so you, uh, by reasoning it does it exist on the parts you know there are other reasons right and one reasoning is it's merely labeled right so how do you use the reasoning of dependence right one and this is the hardest there is the reason why they teach these other reasonings that we were going over like we started to go over last time we'll go over more of them next time there are many reasonings right the seven point reasoning the five point reasoning the four point reasoning. the ultimate reasoning is dependent origination but the hard part is, if you just sat down and said, let's say you sat down, let's say we're Matt, right? You sit down in front of the fridge. You say, oh, I can feel the truly existent eye that wants a hamburger. Um, right? And then the problem is that if you just say, if you just said, um, that eye is merely labeled, it's totally empty from its own side. Right? If that works, great, then you're done. You know? The problem is that for many people, it's like we're not yet, we don't have enough wisdom. So we don't see how, like, and uh, Lama Sokapa in, this, in his praise to the, the Buddha for teaching dependent origination, he says, he says, um, and actually he's talking about other Buddhists now, other Buddhist schools, and he says, actually, uh, many people take the reasoning that actually proves that lack of inherent existence and think that it proves inherent existence. And so, like, uh, so there's a danger of that. Words, unless, we ha- unless we have a lot of wisdom, it's like we could think, well, it's merely labeled, so it must really exist. And then again, we feel like it really exists. You see what I mean? Which actually, it doesn't. Or is that what that really proves is there is no inherent, independent, truly existing eye. 
But so that's why there are other reasonings. It's just to help us build up to understanding how it, how, what it means that it's merely labeled, so therefore it's empty. And it's empty, therefore it's merely labeled. Because um, you mentioned, for instance, like, well, how, is, how can that apply to me? Like, how does mm -hmm. that, you know... Uh, in that fashion, um, now that I know how more of how you meant by emptiness, yeah, so I just that, but, um, then how can for for someone who, if you were to, in, in that situation and you were to try to be like, oh well, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't exist, people are going to naturally kind of fight and battle that because how then would you explain to someone, for instance, really those sensations? How would you get to that sort of because if you think about it, that taps into everyone's like deepest fear of non-existence, literally, because they're like everything in their being is going to keep trying to fight it, because <laughs> you're feeling those sensations, you're thinking these thoughts, you're feeling these sensations, and everything like that. And it would be beautiful to be able to say, "Hey, I'm," gonna, you know, if you were to sit down in front of the fridge and just say, "It doesn't exist," but in a way, if him asking that question to give aid and, and guidance, uh, how does that actually really help him? How can you, you know? what would be a more tangible step and stage or you know like for someone literally trying to because to get to an extent to jump from like a to all of a sudden z all of a sudden you're here you're feeling hungry you have no food in the fridge and you thought that something was going to be there and then all of a sudden z well it doesn't exist anyway and neither do i <laughs> so i guess i'm really not hungry anymore you well, know just, well, so a couple more tangible things. to explain like sensations that people are feeling and a way that to, to be able to get them to that point yeah, so, so one thing, just to clarify, so one thing is, um, like, uh, I mean, of course the, um, what's the word, like the, uh, because of, you know, like, this is, it's very difficult, actually, the, the, to realize that, the, the, like, that um, the way, uh, to realize that dependent origination, right, uh, In a sense, is emptiness, right? And emptiness is dependent origination. It's very difficult, actually. Right? It's very, it's actually so hard to realize. That, you know, we can think about it, and it makes sense if you, you know, it can make sense for a moment. But it's actually very hard to realize, right? Because, you know, like actually think about it, right? If if I put myself in Matt's position, right? So let's say I start doing that, right? One thing that might happen is I would say, you know, like, let's say I start to analyze. I think, okay, yeah, you know, so logically I can see that that inherently existent I doesn't exist, right? But then my stomach still feels hungry, right? And why? And actually, this is what this is what I think is interesting, right? In that moment, where my stomach still feels hungry, right? Like my ha because I have beginningless familiarity with ignorance, grasping a true existence. What I'll think is, well, my stomach's still hungry, so I must really exist, right? And, and what I don't realize at that moment is, my stomach feels hungry because it's dependent. There is, for sure, that's dependent origination, right? First of all, I have a stomach because of dependent causes and conditions. Secondly, stomach is merely a label on parts, right? The parts of that organ. And it's experiencing hunger because of causes and conditions, for sure, right? Uh, the karma and then, you know, car karma that led to circumstances where there was nothing in the fridge, you know? Uh, and it's therefore I don't have something to put in the stomach, you know? And, and so it's very tricky, right? Because there is actually experiencing hunger proves that, that there is no inherently existing stomach or person, right? But our habit is that we grasp, when we feel the hunger, we think, that proves I do have an inherently existing. See, so it's like very difficult. But um, I guess to answer your, that doesn't really answer your question, to answer your question more fully, you know, I think, um, you know, in terms of really like using the wisdom understanding emptiness, right? Like, and, and we'll get into this more detail in another, another one of the classes, but I'll at least briefly say something now, which is like, so obviously it's not an easy thing to realize. You know, like in, um, and it's also not like, let's so say this, like for ordinary people, like begin, we're beginners, right? Like for, for us who are beginners, it's also not so easy to use at a moment, like in, a way, in one way, difficult moment like that. Not that that was horrific, you know, it wasn't like, it's just, but it's not pleasant either. But uh, in one way, that can be the ideal moment to meditate. There's another way, it's quite difficult at that time because you want to go out and jump in the car and go to the store. <laughs> Um, and so I guess what I would suggest is this, is if we want, like, really if we want to use emptiness itself as an antidote, right, to problems, to suffering, then what, what's really re required is actually, um, you know, 
I, I think actually, yeah, for sure, actually, one has to start off by meditating at a time where one's not um, having some kind of visceral experience to get used to it, right? So you would start off, and that's what we were talking about a little bit last time. Like, so you would start off actually, like not at that moment, right? But like actually, if I, if I was like taking uh, Matt's example, right? Maybe not at that moment, but maybe like tonight, if Matt has time, right? Then when he's sitting down at a calm time to meditate, he can think back to that moment, right? And think, okay, that'll bring up my sense of inherent I, right? And then I'll meditate on emptiness. And I'll do that over and over again, right? Um, you know, one, every day for a while, right? And I'll keep reading about emptiness and contemplating and thinking about it, you know, until eventually I'll reach a point, right, where maybe some small problem comes up and I actually, you know, somebody bugs me. And as I walk away, I actually try to think about, I think, wow, I really feel like there's this truly existent, <coughs> annoying person who truly isn't me. Let me meditate on that, right? And slowly, slowly we get, like, closer to doing it in actual, ex- you know, when, when things are bothering us. But I think that on a practical level, we can start, you know, even if it's like for 15 minutes at night or feeling calm. You know, I, I'll give an example, one that's very helpful, actually. is like, so at the end of the day, right, if you think back on your day, right, when you're feeling, you know, after you've eaten dinner, let's say, and, you know, uh, before you go to bed, right? And this is a great use of this meditation, right? Is, is, so at the end of the day, uh, you think back over your day, and you think, Okay, what was my what, what was one or two times today when I really had a sense of strong grasping at either inherent existence of other or inherent existence of self? We are we're doing as as you asked in your question. In a way, we're doing it all the time. Actually, we are doing it. But what were ones where it became very vivid? You know, well maybe it was when I didn't have food, or when somebody said something annoying, or when um, things didn't go my way at work, or whatever, right? And I had this feeling, right? And then you meditate on it, right? You use that for your meditation, and um. You know, one thing is it becomes quite funny in a way, right? Because, like, you'll realize, like, wow, like, you know, look how many conceptual, like, look how many concepts I gave rise. You know, actually, in real life, we give rise to so many, like, based on that, right? Like, if somebody says just one comment, right? Actually, like, uh, actually, some, uh, yeah, okay, last thing, and then we'll stop. Because we have a couple more minutes. Like, uh, sometimes Lama's open points to that. He says, like, he, 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 he's very funny sometimes. He'll so, like, say, you know, just based on, like, like the people, uh, the other person's facial expression, right? Yeah. He said, then we give rise to so many elaborations and thought, right? So like you walk by and the person goes like, like that? <laughs> and you think, oh, that's nice and they like me, right? And then like if you walk by somebody and they just go, <laughs> you know, just there, for, they don't even say a word, right? And then depending on the context, you can start having all these, ele- you know, they don't like me, well, I don't like them either, you know, like, <laughs> first, like you can start having so many different, right? And then you can think like, actually it can happen, right? You see, like if, especially if it's a person who you have a history with, right? We're just based on, like, that, right? Then that night, you could, like, sit there until you finally are going, like, you know, well, I'm going to have to quit my job. And, like, <laughs> you know, how can I get them fired? Then I wouldn't have to leave. And, like, you know, they're the one who's wrong. And, you know, you could, like, make up all, like, huge story, right? Like, we're so many different, like, concepts, right? Like, and they can become totally, like, uh, at times, you know, if you get really obsessive, you know, if you're triggered, right? If your stuff, your stuff is triggered. Right? It's unbelievable how much you can make up, isn't it? Like, whereas we, I think everybody does that. It's something, you know. And finally, like, you can be, like, um, where the whole universe seems like it's this, like, you know, like, that's all exists to you, right, at that moment. And so on a very, that's a very good one, right? Like, to stop and just say, wow, like, like, in other words, um, like, in other words, based on the label, right? There was, like, to start, right, there was a base, just that, right? Just the, the base, one little facial expression. Then there was a label, right? Bad or angry or whatever the thing was, right? And based on that, right, based on that one label, then I gave rise to so many other uh, mental elaborations. And if you actually do that, I'll, one thing I'll say for sure, if you do that regularly, right, there will come times where you start laughing at yourself. It's like, oh my God, like, really? I made that much up? Like, and that's a use. You know, that's very useful. And a simple, you don't have to be like some great meditator. You don't have to like realize something, you know, but that's very useful, isn't it? Like, that you can see, wow, like, I make all this up. And it's all like my own mind projecting story after story. And it's all based on the what? The base, right? And then a label, right? And then based on that label, I can do everything. And then you can realize, like, wow, I do that. Everything I, like, you start to realize, wow, everything I do in my life is based on, you know, there are these appearances of some base. I label things. And then based on my label, I do all my, all different actions, right? I go after this, and I set these goals, and I try to achieve this. And and some are good, and some are, you know, some may be healthy, and some may be unhealthy. But they're all based on just that, right? And I base my entire, and actually, like, wars are based on that, Um, you know, like, uh, what's the word, like, you know, uh, like, all the biggest, you know, like, nations are based on that, 
And so that's very easy. And that was actually why I mentioned that, because the, the reason why I said about, like, it, it taps in general theory, the, all these things that we create and we come up with all the way up to the biggest, like, these wars that we put on, um, or even <laughs> the woman who caused the whole situation with the highway with the, the two different things, like the mayor or something like that. But is because we we feel this ultimate fear if to think that we don't exist. And so if to be able to at least maybe get to a point to extend <laughs> with everything outside of us, but I can definitely see see that there would be some some deeper, it would be a lot harder for someone to really tap into ultimate survival of existence. Everything, you know, from feelings, all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, you didn't validate my feelings because that's coming from a feeling of I exist, I'm here, I, you know, yeah. I'm hungry, I'm, I, it's because I, I exist, I'm here. Um, these, these wars and different things like that all still come from all these different things from the fact that it, it still taps into things of, we want to know that people know that I exist, I'm here, I'm, you know. And one comment so, on that, I agree 100%. And one thing I'll say too that, um, just because I think it's useful for meditation, is this is uh, you know uh, yeah the Buddhist tradition says this is true that uh, it says that um is if you start meditating on emptiness and the, the way we're just talking about and a fear of non-existence arises like the fear that I don't exist arises mm -hmm. uh, that's a good sign actually right. in other words, actually from a, from a meditation point of view from a practical point of view meditate if you're sitting mm -hmm. now you know I'm not talking about like feeling you don't exist just in some general way but if you're sitting down meditating on emptiness and a real feeling of fear like mm -hmm. it feels like I don't exist. Is, that's a sign you're doing it right, so keep going. In other words, and, and use that as a sign that you're headed in a good direction. Um, so if that fear arises, that's a good sign. So don't, um, don't th sometimes people have the wrong view, oh no, that rose, I better stop. Whereas that's a sign you're making progress, actually, so keep going. It's a sign you're starting to hit the mark of, and so just keep meditating. In other words, and, and one thing that's good is because um, whereas when you meditate on emptiness, you're not destroying, uh, you know, you're, you're, not, um, you're not negating, you're not like, What's the word? Getting rid of, you know, what's the word to say this? Like, you know, you're getting rid of, what you're overcoming is an illusion about something that never existed in the first place. You know, so it's not that you're negating uh, things that exist. You're negating something that never existed to begin with. And so it's healthy. That's all. Um, so it's not bad. I found that I had to be, that I, I have to be willing to die. If, I, if I'm willing to die, there's really no block. Then you can meditate. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I had, I had that aha moment when I was after three days of meditation where I had the fear of non-existence. It was constant meditation because you've meditated everything else out of existence at that point, and so you have nothing. And the idea was to meditate on nothing. But I had that some fear of like not being able to grasp to, onto anything. But the more we meditated, the more I, I got past that. And it, what it felt like was when you're really hungry and, and you can't get to eat because you know, you're at work or whatever, and suddenly you lose that hunger and you say, oh, screw it, I'm not going to eat it anymore. <laughs> and, but you come to a, a point of, 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 of comfort where you don't need that food anymore. Yeah. It was, it, you realize your body just forgot about it. And that's what it felt like to, to get past that point of fear. Perhaps you will bring this in some other class, but the link between emptiness and impermanence. Oh, sure, we can talk about it. Yeah, I know we better stop. So we'll, we'll talk about Yeah, we can bring that up, though. That's a good topic. That's a very good topic. Mm -hmm. So it's, maybe we'll bring it next. Uh, and so, oh, just one thing. So just so people, yeah, so we will get to that in another class. Mm -hmm. And just one thing to be clear. So next week, there's no, uh, or we're skipping next week uh, in terms of discovering Buddhism class, but it's two weeks. Uh, and Gabe's going to put that on the way. I just sent it out, so um. We'll have a, so two weeks from today, Sunday, which will be Saturday, the February 1st, I think it is, or 2nd? Mm -hmm. It's the first Saturday of February, is the next class in this series. And they'll go, and we put up, Gabe's going to post it, I just sent him yesterday an email. But there will be three classes in February, so three more classes in this series. And then, we'll, and I guess then we're supposed to do a one-day retreat or something on the Heart Sutra, which we'll have to schedule. But there will be three more classes in this series, um, starting, that will all be in February, three different Saturdays in February at the same time. And they'll be on the website in the next day or two, I guess. Next Saturday um, is no class, though. Uh, it's still two weeks from today. Uh, because next week, the, next week there's a thing on Sunday, so I, I couldn't do both days. Um, and then uh, one other quick comment before we stop is, uh, so on the back table there, uh, Dondra brought these, um, they're really cool little uh, stickers like, and uh, cards of the mantra of Namgyalma. 
and um, there's a little card there explaining some of the benefits, and there's for free. So you know, a, but the, the benefits are like it says by Lama Zoparimshe. He it was it was um it's just like a it's a pretty uh, mantra that uh, Jen created a beautiful color colorized version of. And so you, you can stick them on a car window, like on the inside window of your car. You can put them in the house on a window. You can frame them, put them. You can put them in your office. But um, and there's like it's supposed to be that uh, sort of say it. if the, any building they're in, the human beings, the animals, and the insects in that building get some kind of good karma or purification. So it's free. Take them. Also take them and give them away to people. So the, you know, is that we made lots of copies to, just to give away. That's all. Cool. So just to give them for free to whoever you want. And if you're taking them though, the one request we have is we want to just. Uh, Lama, it's a project of Lama Zopram to, to, uh, to share this with people. So we just wanted to ask one, we're asking only one thing from you, that you write down how many you're taking, and, and it, you don't have to write down your name if you don't want, but say, you know, five are going to go to office buildings, or three are going to houses. So at the end, what we want to do is just tell Lama Zopram, we gave away thousands, they went to, you know, 500 went to houses, yeah. and 200 went to buildings, and, you know, 3,000 went to an office, whatever, you know, like, so that, just so Lama Zopram would like that, you know, just for fun, fun project. So uh, feel free to take as many as you want and give them away. And last thing is, let's just dedicate our merit, right? So any good karma we created, any virtue, any positive energy. So um, do this, right? Like, actually, let's just dedicate. Um, actually, let's dedicate the one Lama Zopa's um, dedication that he does, right? So these positive this, uh, merit, this good karma, which is merely labeled, totally empty from its own side. By virtue of that, may I, who exist in mere name, Totally empty from my own side. May I achieve the Buddha's enlightenment, which is merely labeled, dependently arisen, totally empty from its own side. And lead all sentient beings, right, as vast as the vastness of space, who are merely labeled, totally empty from their own side, to the state of enlightenment which is merely labeled, totally empty from its inside, as quickly as possible. May I, you know, by virtue of this, be able to actualize uh, compassion, bodhicitta, with the wisdom, understanding, emptiness, and then, you know, free, uh, and use those qualities of compassion, skill, and wisdom to liberate ourselves and countless others who suffer.